For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Canyoneering, with its exhilarating highs, offers a taste of adventure like no other. This extreme sport comes with some real dangers. Many canyons are located in remote and challenging terrains, far from immediate medical assistance. Injuries or emergencies can escalate rapidly due to the difficulty of rescue operations. The dynamic nature of canyons means that rockfall, debris, and loose rocks are ever-present dangers and often put these adventures in precarious situations. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. Nestled in the breathtaking southern Utah, a few miles from Moab, you'll find a captivating landscape that is a masterpiece of time, wind, water, and geological artistry. Canyonlands National Park. Every canyon, arch, and butte tells a story written in the ancient rock layers as you explore the vast expanse of this extraordinary park. In Canyonlands, you'll discover a world where the Colorado and Green Rivers have been a patient artist, etching deep canyons and mesas into the rugged terrain. The play of light and shadow across the dramatic landscapes evokes a sense of timelessness, inviting contemplation and reflection. As you traverse the park's diverse districts, Island in the Sky, the Needles, and the Maze, you'll encounter a myriad of geological formations. Each district has its unique geological formations and landscape, with the Maze being the most remote and challenging to access. The Maze is a true wilderness area with intricate canyons and mesmerizing rock formations, offering visitors a truly wild and rugged terrain, renowned for its isolation and challenging access. It's often considered one of the most remote areas in the United States, requiring careful planning and preparation for those venturing into its depths. Limited roads and trails make the maze a destination for experienced backcountry enthusiasts seeking solitude in a true wilderness experience. The maze is characterized by a labyrinth of towering sandstone canyons, slot canyons, and unique rock formations. The intricate network of canyons and fins can be disorienting, contributing to the district's name. It's a challenging environment, and visitors are advised to be prepared for extreme temperatures, harsh terrain, and the possibility of getting lost or, in some cases, trapped. For Aaron Ralston, his Canyonlands adventure would be life-changing. On April 26, 2003, Aaron parked his truck at the dirt trailhead for Horseshoe Canyon, part of a Canyonlands National Park located 15 air miles northwest of the Mays District. Originally planning a 30-mile biking and canyoneering circuit through Blue John and Horseshoe Canyons for a spontaneous five-day road trip after a canceled mountaineering trip with friends, Aaron, with a few days off from his job at the Ute Mountaineer in Aspen, Colorado, embraced the opportunity for a desert adventure. With a 25-pound pack filled with climbing gear, food, and a gallon of water, he eventually reached the entrance of Blue John Canyon, locking up his bike. By 2.30 p.m., seven miles into the canyon at the midpoint above the 65-foot-high rappel known as Big Drop, Aaron found himself navigating drops, ledges, and twists. Approaching a 10-foot or 3-meter dry fall in the canyon floor, a point of commitment, Aaron descended carefully using in-cut handholds on the left wall. Only four feet wide at certain points, the canyon deepened dramatically with each step. At 2.41 p.m., he faced another challenge, a 12-foot or 3.6-meter drop-off with a large chalkstone downstream, creating a claustrophobic space. Planning to use the chalkstone for stemming, Aaron positioned himself above it, confirming its secure placement with precautionary kicks. However, as he slid over the chalkstone's edge, it teetered, prompting him to let go. Unable to move backward without risking a fall over a small ledge, the next three seconds unfolded in slow motion. The falling rock smashed Aaron's left hand against the south wall, yanking his left arm back as the boulder ricocheted in the confined space. The boulder then crushed his right hand, tearing the skin off the lateral side of his forearm. The only thing he heard after was a deafening silence. As stress morphs into pessimism, Aaron faces a dire situation. He acknowledges only one viable course of action with insufficient water, lacking a pick to crack the boulder and without a rigging system. Speaking slowly aloud, he tells himself, you're going to have to cut your arm off. The weight of those words triggers a revolt in Aaron's instincts and emotions, 
His vocal cords tense and his voice undergoes a change in octaves. But I don't want to cut my arm off. Aaron, you're going to have to cut your arm off. Recognizing he's caught in an internal debate, Aaron lets out a half-hearted chuckle, acknowledging the absurdity of the situation. Despite knowing he can't see through his arm bones with either blade of his multi-tool, he decides to persist in picking away at the boulder. Darkness seeps from Aaron's penumbral hole, spilling into the desert. Establishing a rhythm, he pecks at the rock at two jabs per second, pausing to blow dust away once every five minutes. Time slips past, and before he knows it, it's nearly midnight. Perhaps due to growing fatigue, a song plays over and over in Aaron's head. Even if he wanted to sleep, the penetrating chill of the night air urges him to keep attacking the rock to generate warmth. As his consciousness fades, his knees buckle, and his weight tugs on his wrist in an agonizing call to attention. Realizing that conserving energy is crucial, Aaron decides to construct a seat. Getting into his harness is the easy half of the equation. The difficult part is getting some piece of climbing gear hung up on a rock overhead, something that can hold his weight. His first dozen tries fall short, but then with a brilliantly lucky throw, the carabiner bundle he's rigged hits the wide mouth of the crack, drops into the pinch point, and with a tug at just the right moment, wedges tight. A wave of happiness washes over Aaron. With two adjustments of the knots, he can finally lean back and take some weight off his legs. Fifteen minutes later, however, his harness begins restricting the blood flow to his legs. He alternately stands and sits, establishing a pattern that he repeats in 20-minute intervals. Aaron takes up his knife again in the coldest hours before dawn and hacks at the chalkstone. Bright daylight is visible on the north wall, 70 feet above. Aaron turns off his headlamp. He's made it through the night. 3.05 on Sunday. This marks my 24-hour mark of being stuck. On the second day, Aaron prepares for action, gearing up to establish a more secure anchor that can serve as the foundation for a rigging system aimed at dislodging the boulder. A small triangular horn becomes visible on a shelf six feet above Aaron's head. Despite encountering difficulty in tossing the webbing over it, with the material repeatedly slipping free, Aaron spots a fissure on the right side of the horn and adjusts his technique. Just as the knot is about to reach the crest of the horn, he places the rope leader in his teeth, twitches the webbing, and skillfully slips it back into the slot. Next, Aaron attaches a metal rappel ring over the yellow strap, forming a loop with the ring at the bottom. The anchor setup, which takes two hours to complete, proves successful. To further the plan, Aaron cuts 30 feet of climbing rope, tying one end around the chalk stone and threading the other through the rappel ring. Despite applying force to the rope, there is no discernible movement from the boulder. Drawing upon his search and rescue experience, Aaron opts for a modified Z-pulley system, incorporating a haul line to lift the boulder. Employing Prusik loops and carabiners for two changes in direction, theoretically tripling the force, he tirelessly works for hours, but the boulder remains steadfast. Taking a moment to catch his breath and check his watch, Aaron realizes it's past one o'clock and he's perspiring and panting. Suddenly, distant voices reverberate in the canyon. Aaron's mind registers exhilarated surprise and his breath catches in his suddenly dry throat. Holding his breath, he strains to listen. Ralston cries out, help! The echoes of his shout gradually fade and Aaron eagerly awaits a response, but none comes. Shouting for help once more, the desperation in his quivering voice disturbs him. Holding his breath again, after the dying fall of his shout, only the thumping of his heart filled the air. A crucial moment passes and Aaron realizes there is no one in the canyon. His hopes and morale plummet. For the first time, Ralston seriously entertains the idea of amputating his arm. Arranging everything around him, he evaluates the potential use of each item for a makeshift surgery. His two main concerns are securing a cutting tool capable of the task and a tourniquet to prevent excessive bleeding. Examining the blades on his multi-tool, Ralston observes that the inch-and-a-half one is sharper than the three-inch blade. He decides to utilize only the longer blade for hacking at the chalkstone and preserves the shorter one for potential surgery, despite the sharper edge of the blade. Ralston instinctively understands that he won't be able to hack through his bones, 
lacking anything resembling even a rudimentary saw. Shifting his attention to the tourniquet, Ralston experiments with the hose from his empty camelback. Cutting the tubing free from the reservoir, he manages to tie it in a simple knot around his upper forearm just below his elbow. However, he struggles to cinch it down. The plastic is too stiff. Aaron possesses a segment of purple webbing fashioned into a loop, which he untangles and wraps around his forearm. Despite investing five minutes in forming a double knot, the loops remain too lax to impede circulation. Recognizing the need for a stick or carabiner to tighten the loops, Aaron fastens the gate of his last unused carabiner through the loops and twists it twice. The webbing presses deeply into his forearm, causing the skin near his wrist to pale. Witnessing his improvised medical setup function provides a subtle sense of satisfaction. However, amidst his optimism, Aaron acknowledges a darker undercurrent to his contemplation. He grasps that unless he can devise a method to cut through the bones, amputation remains an impractical option. To test his courage, in the event that amputating his arm becomes a viable plan, he experiments by holding the shorter blade of the multi-tool against his skin. The tip pierces between tendons and veins a few inches above his trapped wrist, leaving an indentation in his flesh. Yet, repulsed by the sight, he realizes he cannot bring himself to follow through. Overwhelmed, he sets down his knife and wretches. Ralston finds himself unprepared for the tormenting anxiety of a slow death, contemplating whether it will manifest tonight in the cold, tomorrow with dehydration cramps, or the following day in heart failure. The passing hours weigh heavily on him as night blankets the sky, time expands and Ralston's agony intensifies. Despite not fully exploring the option of amputation, a lack of confidence in his tourniquet prompts Ralston to search for something more flexible and elastic than his previous solution. The neoprene tubing insulation from his camelback sparks an idea. Excited, Ralston retrieves the discarded tubing insulation from his pack. Using his left hand, he wraps the thin, black neoprene twice around his right forearm, ties a simple overhand knot, and tightens it with one end in his teeth. Doubling and tripling the knot, he then takes a carabiner and clips the neoprene, twisting it six times. Acting on impulse, Ralston takes his multi-tool and opens the long blade. Instead of directing the tip into the tendon gap at his wrist, he positions the blade against the upper part of his forearm. Surprisingly, as he presses on the blade and slowly draws the knife across his forearm, nothing happens. Perplexed, he presses harder, but still there is no cut, no blood, nothing. Back and forth, he vigorously saws at his arm, growing more frustrated with each attempt. Exasperated, he eventually gives up. Later in the afternoon, he moves the contents of his bladder into his empty water reservoir, setting aside the orangish-brown discharge for the unappetizing but inevitable moment when it becomes his only liquid. A faint stirring prompts him to consider prayer. Having not attempted it before, he closes his left hand into a loose fist shuts his eyes and lowers his forehead onto his hand. God, I am praying to you for guidance. I'm trapped here in Blue John Canyon. You probably know that and I don't know what I am supposed to do. Please show me a sign. Slowly tilting his forehead back until he's looking up through the pale twilight, Ralston finds nothing. On the fourth day, Aaron finds himself with just under three ounces of water remaining. Placing the bottle in his crotch, he unscrews the lid. However, as he lifts the bottle to his mouth, the lid catches on his harness, causing the bottle to slip. His sluggish brain reacts too slowly for his hand to catch it before it tilts almost horizontally, and a splash of the precious liquid darkens his tan shorts, transforming the red dust into a sheen of glistening mud. Aaron ponders whether the police are involved in a hypothetical search at this point. Shifting away from dim hopes of rescue, Aaron conjures a series of vivid memories that evoke a tidal change of emotion. Surprisingly happy and rejuvenated, he starts recording a video. It's 6.45 in the morning on Tuesday morning. Mom, Dad, I really love you guys. Thank you both for being understanding and supportive. I really have lived this last year. I wish I had learned some lessons more astutely, more rapidly than what it took to learn. I'll always be with you. Gradually, Aaron becomes aware of the cold gaze of his knife. There's a purpose behind everything, including why he brought that knife, and suddenly he comprehends what he's about to undertake. 
Summoning his courage, he disassembles a purple Prusik loop from the rigging and fastens it around his right biceps, preparing the rest of his tourniquet as he refined it yesterday. Unfolding the shorter blade, Aaron closes the handle and clenches it in his fist. Elevating the tool above his right arm, he selects a spot on the top of his forearm. Hesitating, he abruptly halts his left hand a foot above his target. Then, he repositions his tool, and before he can restrain himself, his fist forcefully thrusts the blade down, embedding it to the hilt in the flesh of his forearm. Holy crap, Aaron, he utters aloud. What did you just do? Yesterday, it seemed implausible that his knife could ever penetrate his skin, but he accomplished it. As he grips the tool more firmly and wiggles it slightly, the blade encounters something solid, his upper forearm bone. He taps the knife down and senses it, striking his radius. Suddenly intrigued, Ralston observes minimal sensation of the blade below the skin level. Confirming this, he withdraws the knife and slices upward at his skin from underneath. The flesh stretches with the blade, transmitting signals through his arm as he opens an inch-wide hole. Fascinated, he prods at the gash with the tool. He realizes cutting through the bone will be extremely difficult, near impossible with the knife he has. Sweating from the adrenaline, he's determined to do it, and the fact that he shouldn't add to his enjoyment. Just do it. Get it over with. It doesn't matter. Every tablespoon of water satisfies him as if it were a mouthful, and immediately he gulps at the dribbling flow. With closed eyes, he contemplates the grim realization that he has consumed his final drops of water. On the fifth day, Aaron gazes directly into the camera, stating, It's Wednesday afternoon. Some logistics still to talk about. Ralston is recording his will, detailing who is to inherit his possessions and where to scatter his remains. Looking straight into the lens, he continues, I'm holding on, but it's really slowing down. The time is going really slow. So again, love to everyone. Bring love and peace and happiness and beautiful lives into the world in my honor. It would bestow the greatest meaning for me. Thank you. I love you. Somewhere within his mind, Aaron acknowledges that he won't survive the night in Blue John Canyon. The day has been cool, and this night will be the worst yet. It's not something he debates or internally discusses, but the consideration that he is going to die in a matter of hours rings true. The canyon becomes an icebox as Aaron faces the biting winds. He only endures two of the freezing nine hours of darkness before deciding it's time to make a final annotation. Confirming the date as April 30th, he scratches into the red rock above the four letters of his name and his birth date. Below his name, he writes the month and year of his eventual passing, April 2003. Leaning back in his harness, Aaron slips into a trance. Suddenly, he walks through the canyon wall, entering a living room. A blonde-haired three-year-old boy in a red polo shirt comes running across a sunlit hardwood floor in what he somehow knows is his future home. By the same intuition, he understands the boy is his own. Bending to scoop him into his left arm, using his handless right arm to balance him, they laugh together as he swings the boy up to his shoulder. The boy happily sits on his left shoulder while he steadies him with his left hand and right stump. Then with a shock, the vision blinks out. He's back in the canyon, echoes of the boy's joyful sounds resonating in his mind. Despite having already accepted that he will die where he stands before help arrives, he now believes he will live. That belief in the boy changes everything for him. After enduring five days of gritty buildup adhered to his contact lenses, Aaron's eyes sting with every blink and hazy fringes of cloud frame his murky vision. Sip after sip of acidic urine has worn down his gums and left his palate raw. Unable to hold his head upright, it lolls against the canyon wall. Miserable, he observes another empty hour pass by. The uplift he felt from his vision of the boy has completely dissipated. There is no indication whatsoever that this dreadful stillness will end, but he can make it end. He can resume smashing the chalk stone with the rock, Using his knife, he starts clearing particles from his trapped hand, employing the dulled blade like a brush. While sweeping the grit off his thumb, he inadvertently gouges himself, tearing away a thin piece of decayed flesh. It peels back like the skin of boiled milk before he grasps what is happening. He was already aware that his hand had to be decomposing without circulation, but he wasn't sure how rapidly the putrefaction had progressed. Now he suddenly comprehends the heightened interest of the local insect population in his hand. The following details are extremely graphic and some may find the following details highly disturbing. Viewer and listener discretion is advised. Driven by curiosity, he prods his thumb with the knife blade twice, 
On the second attempt, the blade penetrates the epidermis, akin to cutting through a stick of room temperature butter, releasing a distinct hissing sound. The escape of decomposition gases is alarming. The rot has progressed more rapidly than he estimated. Though the smell is faint to his desensitized nose, it is profoundly unpleasant. Overwhelmed with fury, he lashes out, attempting to yank his arm forcefully from under the sandstone handcuff, desperate to sever any connection to this decaying appendage. He thrashes himself in every direction, screaming in pure hatred, battering his body against the canyon walls, losing every ounce of composure he had fought so intensely to maintain. Then, he feels his arm bend unnaturally in the unyielding grip of the chalk stone. An epiphany strikes him with the magnificent glory of a divine intervention, which instantly brings his fit of rage to a halt. If Ralston torques his arm far enough, he can break his forearm bones. He can just bow his entire arm until it snaps in two. Holy Christ, that's it, he exclaims. Without a moment's hesitation, he barely comprehends what he's about to undertake. Swiftly unclipping from the anchor webbing, he crouches until his buttocks almost touch the stones on the canyon floor. Placing his left hand under the boulder, he pushes with increasing force, applying maximum downward pressure on his radius bone. Gradually bending his arm down to the left, the snap of the bones resonates like a muffled cap gun shot inside the canyon. Urgently, he rushes to clear the chalk stone, determined to maintain composure. Without a break and once more in silence, he lifts his body over the rock. Dragging his shoes against the canyon walls, he pushes with his legs and grabs the back of the chalk stone with his left hand, pulling with every ounce of intensity he can muster until a second cap gun shot ends the anticipation in his ulna. Sweating and euphoric, he examines his right arm again. Both bones have fractured in the exact location just above his wrist. Overwhelmed with excitement, he hurries to deploy the shorter and sharper multi-tool blade, entirely skipping the tourniquet procedure he had rehearsed. Placing the cutting tip on his wrist between two blue veins, he pushes the knife into his wrist, observing his skin stretch inward until the point finally pierces and sinks to its hilt. And this was only the halfway point of the unthinkable task Aaron was about to commence. The following details are extremely graphic and some may find the following details highly disturbing. Viewer and listener discretion is advised. Aaron would describe the amputation attempt. The actual cutting was a different kind of pain. There are nerve endings in certain parts of your arm tissue, so when I broke the bone it hurt of course, but for me it was a happy moment because that was what was trapping me. It was the first time I realized I would soon be free. I broke the top and then the bottom by bending my arm in the configurations I knew would snap it. That moment was the key to it all. If you can put yourself through all that and you're smiling a big beaming pearly grin, you know you're winning. That stayed with me for the next hour. I was cutting through the skin, hacking through the muscle, breaking the tendon in my arm. I would feel the pain, then I would smile because that pain meant impending freedom. When I hit the main nerve, which is big like a piece of extra thick spaghetti, I had to snap it like I was plucking a guitar string with an upturned knife. And when I did that, it felt like I had just vaporized my arm up to my shoulder. I took a real sharp intake of breath, closed my eyes and just felt the most intense fire burning through my arm. But at the end of that 30 seconds, I was smiling again. I hadn't blacked out, I hadn't lost consciousness, I hadn't shed a tear, I hadn't even said ouch. The best moment was when I got that last piece of flesh cut and I stepped back. It was a real feeling of happiness at all the possibilities available in life. It took approximately an hour for the entire process to unfold. On May 1st, 2003, Aaron Ralston secured his tourniquet, reached the base of the canyon, drank water from a stream, and initiated his hike out of the park. He crawled through a narrow winding canyon, rappelled down a 60-foot cliff, and walked some six miles down the southeastern Utah Canyon. Two Dutch tourists discovered him and provided food and water. By the time he encountered the tourist, Ralston was just two miles from the nearest road. They assisted him to a helicopter that had been searching for him, initiated by his mother. Upon landing in the helicopter in Moab, he casually remarked, I walked off the helicopter to a gurney and started filing my report with the National Park Service folks who were waiting. In a press conference filled with almost unimaginable details, Aaron appeared to be the person least affected by the retelling. He shared the account 
in a matter-of-fact tone punctuated with light-hearted asides that hinted at the level of detached calm and mental strength the operation demanded. Regarding the knife, he casually mentioned, essentially, the kind of thing you'd get if you bought a $1.15 flashlight and got a free multi-use tool. Slim and pale Ralston made frequent references to prayer and spirituality in his news conference. He said he felt a surge of energy on the third day, which happened to be the National Day of Prayer. I may never fully understand the spiritual aspects of what I experienced, but I will try. The source of the power I felt was the thoughts and prayers of many people, most of whom I will never know. Following his recovery, he persisted in scaling mountains, achieving notable feats such as ascending Aconcagua in 2005, and later conquering Ojos del Salado in Chile and Montepisis in Argentina in 2008. In the same year, Ralston accomplished the remarkable feat of being the first individual to solo climb all 59 of Colorado's 14ers during winter, a venture initiated in 1997 and resumed post-amputation in Blue John Canyon. August 2009 marked Ralston's marriage and their first child, a son, arrived in February 2010 fulfilling a premonition he had while his arm was trapped in Blue John Canyon. Aaron continues to climb and tour the world, offering unpaid speaking engagements to share his experience, ultimately sharing the ordeal with the world in the critically acclaimed film 127 Hours, which received six Oscar nominations, including Best Picture and Best Actor. When contemplating this harrowing ordeal, Aaron, in his usual manner, expressed, I get a chance to share this joy with people. The thing that it really comes down to for me is that I've been able to improve my life and other people's lives. The public speaking I do allows me to convey the gift that I've been given and help people understand their own lives. Don't just seize the day, but truly appreciate it. The main reaction I get from people is that they are baffled that I continue to adventure. I started to climb again just two months after the amputation. It was four years before I was climbing at the same level I was before the accident, but I'm finally there now. The realities of the wilderness can be brutal. The lessons it teaches is to never take anything for granted, tread lightly and carefully, because at any time, the wilderness will make you pay for mistakes. Every step tests the limits of your endurance. Survival becomes a battle against how much you can take, the boundaries you are able to cross for the price of life. The howling winds and biting cold become your adversaries, challenging the very essence of your resilience. Yet within the heart of adversity lies the human spirit to survive against all odds. In the brutal ordeal of survival, where the odds seem insurmountable, you discover an inner strength, a primal instinct to endure. Your survival is not just a triumph over the elements. It is a declaration to the world that, against all odds, you will stand triumphant. When the harsh reality of isolation and the starkness of your surroundings threaten to break you, it is in those moments that you must forge a pact with your soul. In the relentless pursuit of survival, each calculated decision becomes a mark of your will to resist the comforts of death. The wilderness does not offer sympathy, only challenges that demand your absolute determination. Amidst the extreme weather and the unforgiving terrain, you unravel the depth of your own resourcefulness. Your survival is not guaranteed. It is earned through sweat, grit, and an unyielding commitment to defy the odds. In the heart of the wilderness, where the line between life and death is razor thin, you emerge not just as a survivor, but as a living testament to the extraordinary strength that resides within you that you never knew existed. Heed these words so you can survive an outdoor disaster. Thank you for watching. Want more outdoor disaster content? Check out these stories I believe you'll enjoy.